Welcome to the first video for Chapter 2, Nutrition Tools, Standards, and Guidelines. Learning objectives for this video, we're going to state the significance of dietary reference intakes, or DRI, and daily values, DV, as nutrient standards. We're going to define the role of the dietary guidelines as part of the overall U.S. dietary guidance system. We will review MyPlate which is the visual representation of the dietary guidelines. And we will highlight the concept of a variety, we'll highlight nutrient density, and we'll highlight portion sizes. So we start out by looking at national nutrition standards. And the concept here is that since diet is connected to health, most government is going to provide guidance. So they're going to create standards, guidelines, tools, and implement plans to ensure the nutrition needs of the citizens are met. In the United States, we use recommendations from the National Academy of Medicine to create this guidance. And the result of those recommendations, or taking those recommendations rather, is the dietary reference intakes. Now this is an umbrella term for many different kinds of recommendations that we'll see on an upcoming slide. But the DRI, they're designed for health promotion and disease prevention. So they are recommendations for people that do not have disease or pre-existing nutritional deficiencies. And they provide nutrient recommendations that are specific to age and sex. So an example, if you are a 40 year old male, you should consume 1000 milligrams of calcium per day. And we have recommendations based off age and sex for all of the nutrients that we must consume. So I mentioned it's an umbrella term. We can see we have the National Academy of Medicine. And from that, we derive the dietary reference intakes or DRI, and then DRI is composed of things like recommended dietary allowances, or the RDA, the estimated average requirements, EAR, adequate intake, AI, tolerable upper, upper intake levels, UL, and the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges, AMDR. And now we'll see what each of those mean. So the estimated average requirements, EAR, this is used in research and policymaking. So we don't really apply this to individuals. And this satisfies the need of about 50% of individuals of the given age and sex. So we can say that the ERI for a given nutrient is, for instance, 800 milligrams. And if people consume that, it's going to meet the needs about 50% of the individuals in that given age and sex. Then we have the recommended dietary allowances or RDA. And this is one that we do apply and recommend to individuals. So unlike the EAR, which is only going to satisfy 50% of the individuals, this is going to satisfy 97.5% of an percent of individuals of that given age and sex. So they assign an RDA to a nutrient when there's strong scientific evidence existing to make that recommendation. So there must be evidence through research to show that this amount is what's needed to meet about 97.5% of the individuals in the given age and sex. So this is how it is determined. On the left-hand side, you can see an example of what the research would include. So they feed individuals a certain amount of nutrients to determine how much they need to promote balance in the body. And every individual is a little bit different. So we see that individual A needs this much, individual B needs this much, Individual C needs much more, and this will go on, D, E, F, 
you know, for could be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, and they get an idea of where everybody falls. Now, they take the average of that to get the EAR, so they know that they're covering about 50%, and then they determine that RDA based off the EAR, for those of you that are math whizzes, go two standard deviations away from the mean, and this will cover everybody that's left of the line. And so that will cover about 97.5% of the population. There will be just a few outliers in which the needs won't be met. But if you, you can be rest assured that if you consume the RDA for a given nutrient, then it is very, very likely that you're getting enough of that nutrient to maintain normal function of your body. Other components of the DRI include adequate intakes and tolerable upper intake levels. So AI, it's very comparable to the RDA, but lacks the necessary evidence. So where we said that there needed to be strong scientific evidence through research to provide an RDA, there isn't that research available for some nutrients, but they can still say, all right, we don't have the strong scientific evidence to give it an RTA, but we feel like we know enough that we can say that people need about this much. And so they'll give it an AI. The UL is a little bit different. This is used to identify potentially toxic levels. So if you exceed the UL, then you are increasing the probability that you are going to experience negative side effects from your intake. Some nutrients don't have a UL, and this indicates that there is insufficient data to establish one. So even at very high intakes, they have not seen uh, signs of toxicity. Now, the textbook um, pins this as a naive view versus an accurate view. The naive view being looking at these things as this is a safe amount to consume. Then you have a small area where you have those recommended intakes. And if you go beyond that recommended intake, you're in danger of being in a toxic level. Now, what they're trying to promote is a more accurate view. So the way that the DRI is set up is that if you're falling within the DRI, you're likely safe. And then there's a little bit room for uh, error on both sides of it before you get into the area of a danger of toxicity or a danger of deficiency. So it's not so black and white. The DRI is kind of set up so that if you get in that range of the recommendation, then you are, are probably in good shape. The next one we have is the acceptable macronutrient distribution ranges. And this is a slide that you'll certainly want to remember for exam one and moving forward for the rest of the semester. So these are the healthful ranges of intake for carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And so when we look at our total calories, we recommend that about 45 to 65% of our total calories comes from carbohydrates. 20 to 35% of our total calories comes from fat and 10 to 35% of our total calories come from protein. As I said, these are important numbers for you to understand. And if they don't make sense currently, I am hopeful that once we dive into each of the macronutrients, you'll be able to get a better understanding of what this means. So those are the DRI, and here are three key takeaways. One, there are recommendations for healthy people only. And when we say healthy, we mean the absence of disease or known deficiency. So therefore, healthy people 
They're not for people that have a disease or a known nutritional deficiency. Number two, they represent optimum intakes, not minimums. So we can think about that naive view versus the accurate view, and that there's a built-in safety net for days when value is not met or exceeded. The most important aspect is averaging appropriate intake over time. Number three, the DRI are based on probability and risk. And this means that failure to meet the RDA does not ensure that you're gonna have a nutritional deficiency, just as exceeding the upper limit does not guarantee that you're gonna get a toxicity of that nutrient. There are always exceptions and always outliers. A couple of related terms to know, the estimated energy requirement or EER, this is used to predict daily calorie needs, but is not useful in practice. So it is available, but people that are dietitians, doctors, and other health professionals are not going to be using the estimated energy requirement to determine somebody's calorie needs. The EER is basically just going to be a table that says if you are this old, you are a male, and you weigh this number of pounds, then you should consume this amount of calories. And I think it can get the individual into a ballpark range of what they may need. But as we will learn in later lectures, there are various different things that it can impact somebody's energy needs or calorie needs. And so we don't see the EER as something that is reliable. The second one is daily values or DV. These DV are derived from the RDA and you may have you may recognize them because they are on food labels or nutrition facts panel. Uh, and the DV is useful for comparing two different foods. So we can see our nutrition facts label on the right hand side and you'll see these percent daily value. So what they do is they wanna give an idea uh, to the consumer of how much of a nutrient compared to their need is being met by the food that they're eating. Since we have different recommendations based off age and sex, if they wanted to give the amount for each age and sex, the food label or nutrition facts panel would be multiple pages long. So they've created the daily value based off the highest recommendation available. So for instance, iron, women who are of childbearing age have the highest iron need because they are losing blood monthly through menstruation. And so when they create a DV, they take that iron requirement for women of childbearing age, and they make that requirement the DV. And the same goes for the other nutrients. They take the highest requirement known, and they use that to base the DV off of. The DV is only really useful for comparing two different foods. So say, you are a woman of childbearing age, and you have been told that you need to watch your iron intake because you have been losing blood through menstruation. And so your doctor wants you to choose iron foods that have a good amount of iron. Well, using the DV, you can look at two different food labels and quickly see this gives 0% of your DV and this gives 45%. So if your sole purpose of choosing the food is trying to optimize your iron intake, it can be an easy decision right off the bat. You can see per serving, this one provides much more. I don't personally use the DV, just as a side note, um, but I'm sure there are people out there who do use the DV and may find it useful. Now we have all of these recommendations in the DRI. It's a lot of numbers and tables. And so knowing that the average person is not going to be diving into those tables and figuring out what they need to eat, 
the government creates national guidelines to help implement those recommendations and help people to meet their requirements. Now, in our nation's history, we've had several different guidelines. From 1992 to 2005, we had uh, this food pyramid down on the bottom left. In 2005, they made some adjustments to it and made it called My Pyramid. And one of the major additions to this is they put the exercising individual on the left-hand side to emphasize the importance of exercise. They made the different food groups a little bit more noticeable and they switched it from the horizontal alignment of the uh, food groups to a more vertical. Now, this was not a very well-received uh, rendition of the food pyramid. And eventually in 2011, they went away with it and to our current model of my plate. Now, one of the criticisms of the pyramids is that it was difficult for people to imagine what their plate should look like when they eat. And so my plate was helpful in giving a visual image of what their plate should look like when they eat. And now the thought is, is if you try to mimic your meals to look as much like my plate by filling half of your plate up with fruits and vegetables and then splitting the other side between grains and protein, if you aim to eat most of your meals like this, then you should be meeting your nutritional requirements in the acceptable macronutrient distribution range and satisfying your recommended dietary allowances and uh, adequate intakes. So that my plate is based off the dietary guidelines for Americans. And this is a document that's published every five years by the US Department of Health and Human Services and the United States Department of Agriculture. They've been doing this since 1980. It offers food-based strategies for achieving the DRI values and there's also a physical activity component, uh, and this will be covered in chapter 10 when we do performance nutrition. Now, I've already kind of alluded to this, but my plate is the visual representation of the dietary guidelines. So in theory, if you follow my plate for most meals, you will meet your nutrient needs. And this is an important thing to remember, is that the my plate is the visual representation of our national nutrition recommendations. Now, it's not very helpful to know what my plate looks like if you don't know how to fill my plate in. So one of the missions for you in this course is if you can't identify a vegetable, a fruit, a grain, a protein, dairy products, it should be your mission to start learning and understanding what goes where. Now, some of you may be listening and saying, well, I obviously know what these things are. Everybody knows what these things are. That is not the case. And so if you are on the opposite end of the spectrum and you are have no idea what these things are, just know that you're not alone, but you should be able to learn them with just a little bit of effort. You could also go to choosemyplate.gov, which is a pretty nice website that sometimes I'll refer my patients to. So just looking at some of the recommendations from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. In the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, they say that a healthy eating pattern emphasizes a variety of vegetables, fruit, especially whole fruit, grains, at least half of which are whole grains, fat-free or low-fat dairy products, and or food fortified plant-based substitutions, a variety of protein foods, including legumes, which includes beans, peas, lentils, nuts and seeds, and soy products, and then lastly, oils. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans also states that a healthy Eating pattern limits saturated fats and trans fats, at least to the point that they're less than 10% of total calories, added sugars, 
also less than 10% of total calories. Sodium or salt, less than 2,300 milligrams of salt. And alcohol, one drink per day for women and two drinks per day for men. Now, just like I said on the last slide, if you're looking at some of these words, some of these ideas, and you feel lost, um, all of these things are going to be dealt with at a much closer level in the upcoming slides. So if you don't, I mean, in the upcoming lectures, so if you don't know what whole grains are, we're going to talk about that in carbohydrates. If you don't know what saturated fats are, we're going to be talking about that in our lecture on fats. Uh, so we will get to these things. And if you're confused now, um, please, please have confidence that you will be able to understand them. Now, the Dietary Guidelines also has some basic recommendations. So they want us to follow a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan. This is kind of what we talked about in Chapter 1 with a lifetime of nourishment. They want you to focus on variety, nutrient density, and portion size. Those are things that we're going to look at in upcoming slides. They want you to limit calories from added sugars, saturated fats, and they want you to reduce sodium intake. So these are food, these are food components that have been deemed less ideal for us to consume. And so they want us to limit them in our diet. And they want us to shift to healthier food and beverage choices. Yep, thanks dietary guidelines. Easier said than done for some of us. So when they say they want us to focus on variety, I'll just give an example. So all vegetables provide fiber and potassium, but when we talk about variety, different colored vegetables are gonna have unique nutrient profiles. So red and orange vegetables are high in vitamin A. Dark green vegetables are high in folate, which is a vitamin. Legumes, such as beans, provide iron and protein. And starchy vegetables provide carbohydrates. So we consume a variety of vegetables in order to ensure that we're getting all the benefits of the different colors and different kinds of vegetables that are available to us. Now, if we consume only red and orange vegetables, we're gonna have plenty of vitamin A from our vegetable intakes, but we may fall shorter in things like folate. We may not be getting the appropriate iron from plant-based sources. Dietary Guidelines also wants us to focus on nutrient density. And so here is an example. Nutrient density is a measure of nutrients provided per calorie of food. So we can see in this image from the textbook, we have two 500 calorie breakfasts. On the left hand side, you'll notice that there's many more foods here and there's much wider uh, variety and quantity of nutrients in that food. Whereas on the right, you're only getting two donuts and you're getting a lot of calories, but you're not getting very many micronutrients, not many vitamins or minerals. So we consider nutrient dense foods, those that are lower in calories, but provide higher amounts and greater variety of the vitamins and minerals. So nutrient dense foods, especially are things like fruits and vegetables. They're not very high in calories, but they give us all of the vitamins and minerals that we need. Donuts, pizza, candy, ice cream, soda, those are all things that we say have low nutrient density or are energy dense foods, have high energy density because they give us a lot of energy in the form of calories, but they do not provide us with the vitamins and minerals that we need. 
So the dietary guidelines wants us to focus on nutrient dense foods and consume energy dense or low nutrient density foods in smaller quantities. The advantages of consuming a breakfast of the one on the left right, is that you're going to end up having more food to eat. It's going to make you feel fuller for longer, and that will in turn help to limit your overall calorie intake throughout the day. I know for myself, if I ate the two donuts on the right, I'd probably be hungry again an hour later. And so I'm going to end up consuming more calories in the day than I probably need. Here's an example of how solid fats and added sugars add empty calories to nutrient dense foods. And when we say empty calories, we mean those that add calories, but very few or no vitamins and minerals. So we can take a regular ground beef patty. And if it's extra lean, right, we have uh, 184 calories of nutrient dense food. But if we have a fatty component to it, we're adding on extra calories without giving us any additional nutrients. Same with the chicken breasts, right? I'm sure many of you are familiar with grilled chicken being a better option than fried chicken. And the reason for this is because the process of breading and frying the chicken in fat is going to be adding a significant number of calories without adding any nutrients that are beneficial to us and so on and so forth. Um, that's the main reason why fr uh, fried foods are considered undesirable is because you're dipping it in oil. So you're adding a whole bunch of calories from fat. You're cooking at very high temperature. So you're not only destroying some nutrients, but you're not adding any nutrients to the food. So you're getting extra calories with no real benefit, but they taste good. And then last, the dietary guidelines wanted us to focus on portion sizes. And this is something that's very difficult, but you can just learn by doing. And they have these nice guides to kind of help you out. So portion sizes are often in cups, ounces, tablespoons, teaspoons. And this guide here gives you just some real world examples to kind of put it into perspective if you're not going to be using those traditional measuring tools inside the kitchen. So you can see that a cup of uh, rice, pasta, fruit, and veggies is like the size of your fist. Um, three ounces of meat, fish, poultry is like a deck of cards. Uh, a thumb or a ping pong ball size is one ounce of peanut butter or cheese. And that wraps it up for the first video for chapter two. When we return, we'll be looking more at food labels and the nutrition facts panel.